Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon. Welcome to the latest episode of our sports show. As you know, we've been pre previewing and airing on, on radio and on live on air for the last upcoming month of our special feature, Global uh, Rugby Legends, where we're speaking to renowned rugby internationals over the last 30 or 40 years uh, from the countries of New Zealand, South Africa, Australia, France, uh, Wales, England, Scotland and our own Ireland as well. And I'm delighted for this episode to be joined by a Rugby World Cup winner. In fact, the only guy to score all 11 points for his country in a Rugby World Cup final. Uh, the first uh, success for his country, an iconic year, 1995. Uh, also, it has to be remembered, this guy played... Uh, for two years for Leicester Tigers, in which 73 appearances, he scored a whopping 896 points uh, for the Leicester Tigers as well. Capped uh, from 1993 to 1996, capped for South Africa, 22 appearances, 240 points. Uh, also played for the Western Province as well. And played, what well, people don't, many people don't know, he's, he played in Italy for two years as well in the early 90s as well in 1991 and 92. You guessed it by now, the one and only uh, Joel Stransky. Uh, Joel, uh, a famous name in world rugby, your name, uh, synonymous with South African rugby, that iconic moment, that Nelson Mandela sort of era as well. Uh, does it almost feel like it's a dream or do you almost feel that you live the dream and that uh, it is reality or sometimes you have to pinch yourself and they take me back or did that really happen? Jim, uh, good afternoon or good evening and welcome and uh, thank you very much for having me on the on the show. It's lovely to be chatting. Um, so, so I am someone who, uh, who doesn't really dwell in the past, you know, so I don't really think about it often. Um, I don't, uh, I don't really consider it in, in, you know, in everyday life. I sort of look at it as as my previous life, if that makes any sense, you know, I've, I've gone on and I do other things. I've been involved in a bit of business and I've, I uh, do endurance sport and, and uh, ride uh, mountain bike races and I've done a few Ironmans. And so I, I sort of, I've, I've embraced a whole lot of other challenges in my life. So as, as wonderful as it is to consider the past and to, to remember it for the great time, it was for the really special achievement we as a collective managed to achieve. It is. It's not something I um I relive over and over and and consider in my daily life. And Joel, uh, growing up, uh, I'll do my research. You had a half English, half Chechia sort of uh, family as well. And I do believe you have a very much a Jew, 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 Judaism uh, background as well. Uh, you the bar mitzvah and everything sort of growing up. So did you come from a very sort of religious family, a very religious uh, upbringing, and was rugby sort of frowned upon in terms of that growing up? No, not at all. You know, I came from a Jewish background. My dad was Jewish. My mum um, was uh, was Christian. She did cha change over. She, she my guide to become Jewish, and I did have a bar mitzvah and uh, and grew up in a in a Jewish household. It was never a strict Jewish house household. And, and once I had my bar mitzvah, you know, I, was, I, I I then made Saturday mornings my rugby mornings as opposed to religious mornings. So it was it was uh, never frowned upon to to uh, play rugby. In fact, I think um, it was, you know, very, we, we were in our house, we were all very pr proud that we participated in sport and and in particular, we, we, we played rugby. It was, it was something we grew up with in this country. We grew up with it in Cape Town we, in, in particular. We, as uh, youngsters, we played on Saturday morning and as we got older, we played on Saturday afternoons. It was just the way we grew up. And Joel, uh, were you a revered athlete as a child? Had you a prominent in other sports? Were you a good cross-country sprinter? Were you good at cricket? Were you good at... I know football hadn't really taken off in South Africa at that sort of stage. So were you a good promising athlete? Were a swimmer? Did you immerse yourself in other... I'm hearing from Jan de Villiers, he was actually a really good swimmer growing up. Uh, how about yourself? Was it just always rugby, rugby, rugby for yourself? Well, I definitely, I definitely wasn't a good swimmer. In fact, I swam like a rock. I was a terrible swimmer. And, uh, and, and in fact, I've gone on and done a few Ironmans. I had to go for lessons and learn to relearn to swim. Um, I, I, I was a ball player. Um, any, any ball sport um, was, came naturally to me. I suppose I was quite fortunate. I was quite a, a good young cricketer and played uh, provincial schools with, with, with the great Gary Kirsten. Actually, he was one of my best mates. 
Um, and in fact, at, at about the age of 15, 16, I changed schools and moved. My parents moved away from Cape Town and I moved from, from a school, good rugby school, strong cricket back, cricketing school, to a very prominent rugby school in, in Natal. And uh, my focus switched a little bit then from, from cricket to rugby naturally and, and rugby became the number one sport. But I, I think it's probably the, tr- the same and the truth for, for many of the ball players in, in rugby or for that matter, soccer, you know, the guys who kick well, who, who handle the ball well, the likes of Jean de Villiers, um, you know, if you're good with the, the, the ball, all, all ball sports come quite naturally to you. I was very fortunate. And uh, Joel, in terms of playing uh, at a young age, were you always a fly half growing up or rugby? Were you, were you learned all the positions? Were you thrown into full back? Were you wing? Did you ever find yourself in the front row growing up in different positions? Or did you start off as a fly half or a scrum half and... Do you always start to play those positions growing up from start to finish before you settled on the fly half position? Well, thank heavens I never found myself in the front row. That's the one thing I'll say. That's uh, that's that that that's a different game. It's a different sport. It's a whole other world in in that dark zone. Um, I started off as uh, in fact I think I started on the wing and and then went straight to scrum off. Um, and then to centre and I played uh, played outside centre and then inside centre for quite a long period of my school career and, and only moved to Flav um, when I was about 16, I think, when I moved to school in KwaZulu Natal in in, uh, in KZN. And, and and in fact, then it was only really because in our team, we we, we didn't have a recognised Flav. So the coach said to me, do you want to have a go? And I said, absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll go and have a go at that. And uh, and and it was a, a good move for me. And, and I think, to be fair, you know, the modern game, is a, is a little bit different, you know. I'm quite small. I think in the modern game, every everyone, even the number tens, are quite big nowadays. It's uh, I'm 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 not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's uh, there's a place for the little guy in most teams anymore. And speaking about the little guys, in fact, there was the, your partner, probably a great friend, Lord Mercy, name uh, was probably one of the most revered scrum halves in the world, the Jus van der Vesses, and he he was a little guy as well. But God, he was talented. Um, in terms of Playing before that Rugby World Cup, obviously South Africa because of apartheid were uh, not in it for the previous two years. You were sort of unknown quantity, but did yourself and you develop that sort of connection sort of straight away or was it something that you worked very hard at? Well, firstly, he wasn't the smallest guy around. He was probably six foot, I reckon, and uh, wiry and strong and powerful and that's and athletic, you know, he's, he had great strength and, and speed. He was a real athlete, just and um, and also a great ball player. Probably the the greatest all time overall full package rugby player I think I've I've ever seen. You know, real talent. Um, he, he came from a very Afrikaans background. I came from a very English background. I think um, in in the beginning we we took a little while to gel. You know, took a took a little bit. We learned to. Um, we learned our, and we played for different. We came from different parts of the country. We played for different provincial teams, so it did take a, a little bit to to come together. But I think the thing is, when you when you play for your country, when you play for the national team, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, you know what what your thoughts are. You you want to combine with those players around you. You want to be the best you possibly can in that environment, and you certainly want to be the best unit for the sake of your national team. And I, and I think for for all of us, we, we did the absolute best we possibly could to combine and play together as quickly as possible. And did you feel a sort of, dare I say, because you hadn't featured in the previous uh, two World Cups and the World Cup was being held in South Africa, normally when a country hosts the World Cup, there's great uh, expectation. The players can feel the weight of the nation on their sort of shoulders. But because you hadn't been in the previous two World Cups, did you have that sort of freedom to relax and, uh, and, and feel yourself into the tournament rather than some host, host nations with the expectation, the burden is on them straight off because you hadn't missed, you weren't involved in two previous World Cups. Did they get, give you time to find your feet and, and freedom to really enjoy the whole adventure? Oh, we, we definitely enjoyed it, you know, to have a, to, to have a World Cup on your home soil. Yes, it does add, a, a, you know, a different type of pressure and a different type of expectation. Um, but the support was just sensational. And, and I think for us, particularly in this country, where at the time it was, uh, you know, we were 
on the precipice of, of something either special or something catastrophic from a political perspective. It, it was a time where South Africans came together behind a, a sports team. It was a, an incredibly special time for us. And to have seen that support grow through the World Cup, to have seen you know, people from different cultures um, go from not being rugby fans to being rugby fans, to wearing the green and gold, to waving the flag, singing the national anthem together, winning a World Cup. It was unbelievably special. So from that perspective, it, uh, we were blessed to have had a, a home World Cup. We were blessed to have had a leader like Nelson Mandela who, who used rugby and used sport to, to you know, bring people together and, in peace and, and you know, unite behind a sports team. But I think going into the World Cup where we were maybe even a little bit more fortunate is that there wasn't a massive expectation. We, we, uh, we were not an experienced side. We, you know, we weren't a side that had a massive world reputation at the time. Very little was expected of us. I think if you'd said to South African rugby fans, and what would be a good achievement for that team in the Rugby World Cup in 1995, irrespective of where it was, was to be played, I think most fans would have said, you know, if we get to the semifinals, we'll have done well. Um, and, and yet we went on and we, we beat Australia in the pool game and then expectation grew and the pressure mounted a little bit. And we had a we had, uh, slightly easier quarterfinal than it could have been um, in, in Samoa and then France in the semifinal. And I think the further you go, the greater the expectation grows. But the further you go, the greater the confidence grows as well and you learn to cope with it. Uh, speaking about France, obviously some world-class players on that French team, Philippe Saint-André, uh, Bernard Sala, uh, to name Emilien Tmac, to, to name but a few uh, real renowned sort of super superstars uh, of world, world rugby as well. Obviously you were well averse to playing New Zealand and Australia, but coming into that semi-final, did you know much about the French? Did you face them much coming into that World Cup and be in tournaments or challenges leading up to that? Or were they a known, known quantity? And did you really feel that that was a more dangerous game than the actual final itself? Well, so, I mean, bear in mind, we've been in political isolation up until the end of 1992. You know, 1993, we, we toured Australia and we toured Argentina. 1994, we toured... Uh, New Zealand and then Europe at the end of the year. Um, and then all of a sudden the World Cup was upon us. So, so we didn't have a great understanding or knowledge of any of the other players around the world. Yes, we had a better understanding of the Aussies and a better understanding of the Kiwis, but um, still not a great understanding of them. We had very little knowledge of that French side. So yeah. they were a, a good, they were a, a massive threat to us. And of course, in Durban on that uh, particular day, it absolutely bucketed down there. You know, there was water lying on the field. The conditions were treacherous. There were conditions that didn't suit us. I don't think they suited anyone, to be quite honest. And that French team was a team full of flair and running ability and skillful players, as you mentioned. Um, it probably didn't suit them either. But, I, you know, we were concerned, obviously, because in France, I think they would play in the wet a lot more than we would play in the wet here in South Africa. Um, and, and it was a massive game. And to be quite honest, at the end of the day, we were we were a tad fortunate to come through that one. Mm. And going into a final then, obviously, you have already in a crest of a wave, a whole sort of country uh, behind you as well. Obviously, the old rival, the old enemy, uh, New Zealand. And what will be remembered as a real tight sort of a gritty sort of encounter, low scoring game, it was drip for you. Did you feel that almost it was like, blow for blow, we'll hit you, you will hit us in terms of that scenario that no yard, no inch was given and that it was going to be that sort of every score was going to be a grind to get it. Yeah, very much so. We, so, I mean, firstly, we, we, were, we, were, we were very focused defensively and, and we knew that if we could contain the great journal army, we would have a chance. Um, and and if we could contain him, then it would be exactly that. It would be something that was going to be close. It was going to be down to the wire. It would going to, it would be you know maybe a kick or two that decided. And, and in fact, Kitch Christie um, on the Thursday before the World Cup final at, at, at the kicking session, I went down to do some extra kicking, and he came down uh, and uh, to have a look. He asked me why don't I kick more drop goals? He you know he, I think he too believed it was going to be awfully tight and. And, uh, you know, a, a drop goal might be something that would certainly add value or, or even decide it. And that's exactly what it turned up. Um, it was it was obviously like, like many other World Cup finals we've seen. It was a, 
a, a massive physical confrontation. It was it was tight, and both teams played with a lot of caution. I would think, and um, both teams ended up kicking quite a lot. As um, soon as we you know managed to contain Joan Alomu, the All Blacks also re- realized that uh, you know our defensive pattern was a bit different, and they kicked a bit more. So it it just became a proper. Um, physical arm wrestle of a World Cup final, and I, and I think of of in many Cup finals, it gets down to that sort of game. And Joel, did you sort of once the first penalty went over, once the the first kick went over, did you feel in that sort of momentum? Did you feel that your kicking was there on the day? We all know for fly hats that you always need that first penalty, that easy score to sort of settle you in in terms of that. Did you feel that once the first moment over, you said, right, I'm in my groove here and Let's go in terms of that. We we don't have to think about it from now on. So I, I think uh, I think my, I was in the groove through the whole week. Um, Thursday maybe not so much. We trained on a we practiced on a hard field that uh, wasn't. Um, it was it was quite tough the kicking conditions, but I still kicked the ball pretty well. So Friday we trained at Ellis Park, and I was hitting them so sweetly and so so I, I, I was. I was comfortably in the groove and in a, in a good place going into the game and, and, and full of confidence. You know, we, we, we were all full of confidence. We all believed we, you know, if you get to the final, you've got a great chance of winning it. And, and, and we knew that uh, we had a good chance. We, we believed all along we were the fittest side, the most best prepared side. And uh, we knew if we took our chances, we would have a shot. And taking the chances was, is exactly what we did. And how, does it, how did the emotion at the final whistle, obviously winning the World Cup, I know... It's it's beyond belief, but did it? Did, I suppose did it overwhelming emotion? Did it start to sink in? Did it take three or four days? And people going around that it was your trap goal that won the the rugby world cup. Did you almost think, well, it's not me; it's more the team effort. Start to think it's people are, but people are coming back to me. They're mentioning me the whole time. Or did you almost feel like an overnight sort of superstardom sort of ascended upon you? And was that difficult? I dare say, I know it's a fantastic achievement, but personally, was it difficult for a while? I think it was difficult for all of us because we all went from being, um, you know, not not icons, but certainly um, you know well known rugby players in the country to 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 overnight heroes and uh, and propelled that way. And and again, you know, we propelled that way for winning a rugby world cup, but most importantly, for winning a rugby world cup. At a time where a country, a nation needed something to bring them together, needed something to to inspire them and uh, and and you know create unity in, in, in a peaceful in a peaceful manner, and that's exactly what happened. And the fact that um, Nelson Mandela, you know, was so heavily involved, the fact that he you know held the trophy aloft and and was so so celebrated so joyously, I mean, he was so happy about the win that that we went on a a parade through the country and Madiba was present in some of those places. We, we were invited to Parliament and we had all the, the celebrations. Yes, I think we were. We were all propelled into that um, status. So it wasn't just one or two of us. Uh, I think we all we all shared the, the limelight of what was a, was a wonderful victory. And yes, life, um, life did change, I think, um, absolutely for the better. I mean, there's nothing better in life than being acknowledged and recognized for having done something special for having achieved something um, but it but it did mean we you know we all achieved a level of status that uh, that meant we were in the public eye and we you know we had to treat it as such and Joel do you remember any words Nelson said to you personally after that sort of final whistle when when you met him for the first time did he say any sentence or a joke or share a smile with you so it wasn't the first time we met him. Actually, we met him before the Rugby World Cup even started. We met him down in Cape Town at Silver Mine, uh, which is a, a naval base, and that was where we did a lot of our training. Flew in the in a military helicopter and, and came and had tea with us and wished us luck. And that was before the opening game. And then he came into the change room, you know, minutes before the Rugby World Cup final. He came in in a Springbok shirt with a Springbok cap on and came to wish us luck. And I think it was in 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 that visit where. He, he was very detailed in his good luck messages because he didn't just stand in front of the team and say, you know, go and do your country proud. He, he came around, shook all our hands, had a little private message for each one of us quietly and, uh, and, and then, you know, and then left. And, and his, message, his message to me, I mean, I don't remember the exact words, but it was about um, strategically 
managing the game and, and being the captain of of general play and uh, and 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 it was really insightful and really thoughtful and and it was a clear message that he knew and understood the game of rugby union very very well indeed. Yeah, and uh, Joel, I suppose uh, before I start to finish up to you, just I want to just want to touch on Leicester Tigers for a while. We haven't actually had time to mention that uh, over eight hundred ninety six points uh, for Leicester, uh, obviously. Uh, a real dominant team, a dominant team that won an awful lot in England. Was that, a, did you, did, were you sort of uh, hesitant, first of all, coming to the Northern Hemisphere? Was that your only tie choice to join the Leicester Tigers? Were there other offers as well? Any offers from Ireland? There were, there were no offers from Ireland at that point. There was one, there was a couple of offers from other English clubs, actually. Um, but uh, so, so I came over and I came over to have a look at one of the other clubs. I won't mention the club. And while I was there, um, Peter Wheeler phoned me. I don't know how he got my number and, and how it happened. And he was the CEO at the Tigers. And he, he said, can we have a coffee? And can I come fetch you and just take you up and, you know, have, have a look around at, at Leicester Tigers. And I went up there and it was just sensational. You know, the club, Leicester is one of the great rugby clubs in the world. I would guess pretty much like Munster or, one of, or some of the Irish clubs, you know, very much a, you know, a traditional um, focal point of a city or town, um, very family oriented, um, super supportive. It was just special and it, it was a no brainer. And, uh, and I agreed to go to the Tigers within you know, a few hours and, and it was a great move. It was one of the best moves of my whole career. It was some of the happiest rugby playing times. Um, I made friends who are friends today and who will be friends forever. And one of them is uh, is the coach at Munster, Graham Roundtree, a real good friend of mine, a you know, special man. And um, I, I, I know his team are battling a little at the moment, but but I'm, I'm absolutely no doubt he'll get them into good shape and they'll be a force in the next few weeks. Um, but but special times. And um, both my wife and I were we're very happy there. Our daughter grew up, uh, she was, I think, five or six months old when we, we moved to Leicester. When we came home, she had a Leicestershire accent and uh, it, was, it was quite different for our friends back home to understand this little girl, but uh, it was a really special time for us. Uh, Joel Stransky, uh, before I leave you now, uh, if you look back in the mirror and you look back in some of that, you describe Joel Stransky as a, a rugby player. How would you describe him in two sentences? Well, the first thing I would say is that he was renowned for the famous drop goal, but there was a whole lot more to him than that. And uh, the teams he played in played a great brand of rugby and good running style. And and the Leicester Tigers would be a uh, you know testament to that, as as would be all the teams I played in. Um, I think most importantly, I'd, I'd like to be remembered as someone who loved the game, who still loves the game today, and who's made a lot of friends through the journey. And those are friends for life. On that note, uh, George Stransky. Uh... Sonoma's uh, rugby history, uh, world uh, folklore, and anyway, that famous drop winning goal uh, for your country, winning the 1995 Rugby World Cup. Also a prominent uh, club career as well, 896 points with Leicester Tigers. Uh, 22 appearances for South Africa, 240 points as well. Uh, still very much uh, in love and in touch with the game of rugby. For a moment to Joel Stransky, take care, stay safe, and God bless you, sir. Jim, thank you very much, and thanks for having me on the show. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. Thanks, Joel.